Tomorrow, May 14th, we will be at Broad Rock Park from 1 until 5 with a better day than yesterday and help me help you. Both nonprofit organizations that give back to the communities and the children. Bring your wife, bring your kids, bring your family. Just don't bring that bullshit. Man, you already know what it is. Jay Williams, let's live life, and we're back. We turn off some of this AC and whatnot. So I got to watching this documentary last night on Amazon Prime. It's actually on Discovery Plus. Called Jailhouse Redemption. It's a documentary that takes place here where I stay at, where I live at. Chesterfield County, Richmond, Virginia. And the show is based around a program called The Harp. And in watching this show, within the first 30, 45 seconds of it, I saw guys that had worked for me, that I had to fire because of their addictions. So guys I had known since I first came to Virginia in 1992. First came to live here. Saw a lot of guys that I used to serve. It was um, an unsettling feeling, to say the least. Females I went to high school with, girls that were at one point very attractive, that I didn't know went on to become drug users. Got me to thinking about addiction itself, the drugs in the penitentiary, things people do for drugs, the way they come in, people leaving out with drug addictions that didn't come in with drug addictions, and that's what today's video is going to be on, we'll talk a little more on this documentary that is currently playing on Discovery Plus on Amazon Prime, or just Discovery Plus if you want to get that app called Jailhouse Redemption. The reason I say it was an unsettling feeling is because I know I contributed to a lot of the misery and a lot of the pain that I witnessed while watching this documentary last night. I used to justify why I did the things I did. If somebody else don't sell it to them, they gonna get it. But I gotta eat. I ain't chasing them down to make them buy it. That was my way of making me feel better about being the whole entire piece of shit that I was. Makes me wanna run out and get a sticker to throw in my back window that says shoot your local drug dealer there's no escaping who I once was and even though I try to be the best Jay I can be I try to live a better life I try to lead by example my past is there my past is my past and I'll never be able to escape the things I've done or who I once was but what I can do is talk to you guys give it to you all raw in hopes that nobody else makes those decisions those decisions or goes down that path man. you know how to see it you know how to live it so let's relive it so if you go watch this documentary right Jailhouse Redemption and then you go back to my videos of where I was showing you a day in the life of Jay Williams what we do with my construction company my employees you pay close attention, you're gonna see guys in that video that you're also gonna see in this documentary. Part of what I do with my construction company, this is all leading into what we're getting into. Part of what I do with my construction company, aside from giving people beautiful houses to live in, providing jobs for people, giving people a way out, a big part of what I do is I hire guys with felony convictions, guys with rough backgrounds, guys that most bosses and companies, nah, ain't going to happen. Oh, man, you got a heroin charge for real criminal. Sad fact is a lot of guys won't, they will not hire these guys. Where does that leave a man that's trying to do right? 
He leaves him with his back up against the wall. He's got to eat. He's got to get money. He's got to survive. Nobody wants to get these guys jobs, so they end up back out there in the streets doing what they got to do to make money. I employ these guys. I sit down and I talk to them when I hire them. Anybody that knows me will tell you what I'm saying is true. And I tell them I don't tolerate the drug use. I'm not going to do it. First and foremost, I'm not going to sit by and work you and watch you take your hard-earned money and throw it away. Not to mention whatever your extracurricular activities are outside of work. They may not affect me at the moment. But as you get deeper into your addiction, they're going to. Not all guys, but most times, 90% of the times it has affected me. I've had stuff stolen, vehicles wrecked, guys run from cops in work trucks. If you can name it, it's happened. I've had people very close to me steal from me. Tools, power washers, generators, money, and all that. I also can't allow there to be a weak link in the armor, a chink in the armor, if you may say so, for the sake of the other guys I got around me. Some of these guys have struggled with addiction their whole lives. The longest period they've ever been sober has been while they've been around me because I have their best interest at heart. So I can't let a new guy show up that's getting high behind the scenes, that's sneaking around doing things because I know how it goes. It starts off with this guy sneaking around, getting high, other guys catching on to it. Next thing you know, I got a whole crew of guys that are now getting high. I will work with men. If I see something out of character and I have reason to believe that somebody's doing something they shouldn't do, I'm a boss. I'm going to do my job as a boss. Say what you want about it. I'm going to do my job. I have to ensure this is still here tomorrow. I'll pull the guy to the side. Hey, man, you need somebody to talk to? You going through something? Or are you using again? And they always say no. And I tell them, if you are, tell me. I'm not going to fire you. I'm going to help you get right. I'm going to help you. Get your life back on track. We're going to stop this. And we're going to get you better, man. No, 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 no. I'm asking you, man, because if I see it again and you're telling me I'm tripping and I pull out them piss tests and you piss hot, this is your way out right now. Talk to me. I'm not your average boss. I actually ran these streets. I've done that time. I've been with guys from every walk of life. I've seen every type of addiction there is. I've been an alcoholic my entire life. I understand the struggle. I pop pills from, you know, the day I found out what they were up until I found out what they were capable of. Guys will lie. Nah, not getting high, G. Bro, I just watched you nod out and burn a hole through your arm, through your jeans. Fall all the way asleep and drop your phone and pick it up and go right back to Texan. And then in the middle of Texan, nod out for 10 minutes and then look back up and start texting or you sitting there beside me in the truck talking to me you nod out and in 10 minutes you lift your head back up and go right back into the car what was we saying i know what you're doing it sucks when i have to fire these guys it sucks a lot of these guys i've known for a very long time but that's my job and watching this documentary last night i started seeing some of these guys at one point Last year, I was doing the math, and I talked to guys in jail, but I was doing the math. At one point last year, five of the guys I had fired within a year and a half period were all in the same jail, in the same pod, locked up behind drug offenses. Now, the documentary you're going to watch, it shows the program part of the jail. It doesn't show what jail life is like if you're not in the program. It shows the benefits, the help they offer, the love they give these guys, the treatment they give these guys, the opportunities they give these guys to break the cycle. It doesn't show the other pods where ain't none of that happening, where it's more reality-based, it's more savage. It doesn't show the jail Riverside that if you mess up, you get sent to. It shows the program. 
I've been hearing about this program for a very, very long time. HARP, H-A-R-P. A lot of my employees had went through the HARP, came out, and got their act together. Some of the guys I knew came out, OD and died. Some of the guys I know came out, did go for a little while, reoffended, and are now back in the penitentiary. But five of the guys that used to work for me are currently incarcerated. One, two, three, four of them are in the heart program trying to get help. This program has made nationwide news. I'm a big believer in rehabilitation. I've told y'all. For the jails and prisons in America, it's not about rehabilitation. It's about incarceration, mass incarceration. Where I live at, they're trying to help people get out and become better people. They don't just lock them in there and say, just deal with whatever you got going on, man. And we expect you to be a better person when you get out after you've been through everything you've been through in here. They were talking about the overdose rate. How... My city is riddled with addiction. And I know. I see it every day. I drive through it every day. I hear about people dying on the regular. Still finding out about people to this day, almost eight years after my release, that have passed away. We're like any other city, any other county. Addiction has taken over. More people are, so many people are dying now from addiction and overdoses that it doesn't even make the news. You know, you can go in Burger King bathroom because I know people that have OD'd and died in Burger King, McDonald's, places like that. You can be found dead on the toilet and it'll never make the news because it's nothing new. It's nothing that's going to shock people to think that you're in the front of McDonald's with your two little kids and your wife getting them some Happy Meal, some chicken nuggets. You want a boy toy or a girl toy with a Happy Meal, sir? And that 40 feet away from you in the bathroom is a young man sitting on the toilet injecting fentanyl, injecting heroin. Kudos, man, to Chesterfield County Jail for implementing something to help these people help themselves. To help them become better people and more productive members of society. The sheriff that... that is out there that's doing what he does goes to work on his day off just to check on these dudes truly cares about them the deputies in there get to know these people and they care that is not something that I've ever experienced in my incarceration at no point ever did I have a correctional officer hug me and tell me it was going to be okay at no point ever did I have a correctional officer tell me they love me or that I was important, or that I was special, or I could do more. Never. They were more robotic than anything. They were more scripted, doing what they were trained in the academy. There was no compassion. There was no emotion, unless it was anger. There was no real give a f You know what I mean? Like, nobody cared. Make sure y'all go check that out. Let's get into the drug use in prison. And the lengths that guys will go to get high while incarcerated. Now what I'm about to say, I've said in the past. I'm going to say it again just in case you haven't watched the video. Parents, moms, dads, people that have custody of children. Or children have now turned into adults. They don't want to see their kids, their loved ones locked up. But when they're dealing with someone that's got an addiction... A lot of times it can be a sense of relief. They know they don't have to get that phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning saying their son or their daughter or their grandchild was found in a trap house dead with a needle in their arm. Or that they were found on a Burger King bathroom toilet in a car. For a lot of these people, it, with their loved ones going to jail, they feel like as long as they're in jail, they won't be getting high. As long as they're locked up, they're safe. That couldn't be further from the truth. Watching that show last night, they had a chick overdose and die. In intake, coming in. I know of her. I know who she is. Rest in peace to her. She died right there in jail. Jails, prisons, facilities, rehab centers. Where there's a will, there's a way. P 
people continue to get high. Just because you're locked up don't mean drugs ain't there. Doesn't mean you're going to get sober. All that means is that you're now incarcerated. And that if you got some money, you can play. You got to pay to play. Or you got to offer something. You got to get something up, but you can still get high. People think that once you're locked up, oh, that's the end of it. Let me tell you something. The, these places, at some points, have more drugs inside of them than some of your cities. I've seen drugs on a large, large scale in the penitentiary. We go back to, I flash back to my juvenile days being locked up in Chessfield Detention Center off Cross Road. And I can remember the links we would go to to do dumb shit. Stealing the officer's cigarettes. They put out a cigarette and one of the kids would steal the cigarette butt. And then the next kid, would, his job would be try to steal the lighter. We stole whole entire packs as the guard would sit there in his, in his chair and sleep at night. We'd pop our door, sneak out. We'd rig the doors up so we could open at night. We'd sneak out, crawl out there, steal his pack of cigarettes and his lighter, crawl back in the cell. Now we know we're going to get caught. There's cameras. But by the time they get there, we just smoke so many cigarettes, we're sick, right? And then we'd fish them down the hallway to another cell so they could take some of them so when they come shake us down they can only get but so much right get the lighter up out the cell so they can't recover it and they usually think we'd flush it the first time i want to say it was the first time that i dealt with people getting high while incarcerated was in chestfield county jail the old chestfield county jail the jail you see in this documentary is a new jail the old one has been bulldozed because it was dilapidated it was old it was outdated it just didn't work. Now, when you would go to visitation, there was a vent on the wall. This has since been removed. Like I said, the jail is gone. And they found out about this. This vent had holes in it about the size of a cigarette. So guys would come up there. Girls would come up there to visit the people in there. And they would take a straw. I fill that straw full of weed. Fill it full of coke, dope, meth. All the things you shouldn't have in life. And then they would burn both ends of the straw to seal it. And as you're sitting there through your visitor, you'd see somebody look around, go over to the vent, and foom, 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 foom. Shoot five, ten straws right through the hole. And they'd fall onto the opposite side of the wall where there was an inmate waiting. I want to say I was on dorm seven. I believe it was dorm seven at the time. Which faced the work release side of the building. The side of the building where the weekenders came in to do their weekend time. I like that dorm because I could see people coming and going. I could see cars going down the street. There was a view, the best of a view you could get while being locked up. Well, we had a TV that hung up in the very front of the pod that you don't mess with that TV. That TV was our only form of entertainment aside from the stupid everyday shit that goes on around us, right? I've seen more than one fight behind that TV. Somebody would change it. Somebody wouldn't agree. Everybody wouldn't agree with what this guy was trying to watch. And I could do a whole lot of episodes on fights behind the TV that I saw, right? But we knew there's some drugs that came in on this weekend in particular. And it actually wasn't even a weekend. I think it was a weekday, like a Thursday. We had visits throughout the week. Different guys had them on different days, according to your last name. I knew that some weed had hit. I knew tobacco would hit. And I was hearing about all these other things that hit. Dope pills, coke crack. And I, I remember thinking, like, how do these guys plan on smoking crack in jail? Now, I've told you in the past I'd seen guys smoke it out of a chicken bone. Out of a damn chicken bone. Break the ends off, push something through, get the bone marrow out, and they smoke it out of a chicken bone, right? Only this week in particular, man, while we're in the jail, I want to say it was NBA Finals were on. If, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was the finals that we were all so stoked up about watching. And we would unplug the TV. And right behind the TV was an outlet. And we'd wait till we make sure no guards were in sight. And somebody would get up there and put something in the outlet. Two pieces of metal, paper clips, staples, pencil lead. We What's called popped outlet. Pow, we'd pop it and light a piece of tissue on fire. Guys could light cigarettes. You could light your joint. You could... A lot of different, you know, things you could use that fire for. You had to have that fire. And then we plugged the TV back in like nothing ever happened. That outlet was black behind the TV from how many times we had sparked it to get fire. We wake up this weekend and it's 
one of the weekend days, man, either Saturday or Sunday when the finals was on, and we all had the same routine. They called Chow, we get up, and my favorite meal in the jail was shit on the shingles, which in the real world, that's biscuits and gravy. And rolling rock, rolling rock was hard-boiled eggs. We get up this weekend, get the shit on the shingles and the rolling rock, Commence to eating our trays. They got to bring a big cooler around with coffee. Get you some coffee. Try to get your morning started, right? Somebody goes up there to turn the TV on. Doesn't come on. Smacks the side of it. Bang, bang, bang. Messing with the knob again. Nothing's happening. Looks around the back to see if it's plugged in. And the whole damn cord is going off the TV. Dude snaps out. Big dude. Yo, who the... Cut the cord off the TV. Why would you cut the cord off the TV? You think they're not going to notice the cords off the TV? Yo, who in here cut the cord off TV? Nobody's saying nothing. Now, you got a couple dudes in the back. There was a window back there. All the way at the back that was somewhat propped open. Like, it had the little things where it cranked open. You got a bunch of dudes that have been hanging out all night long in the very, very back. White dudes, Spanish dudes, black dudes. This is a group of about eight guys back there, right? And they have not been to sleep. By now, they're all in bed acting like they're trying to go to sleep. And I know this because they didn't even come get their trays. And if they don't get their trays, when these trays come through, if there's extra trays, you sleep late, you lose weight. Grab another one, now I got two. So me and some other guys had doubled up on our trays that morning. Dude keeps snapping. Now you got other guys coming up there looking. They would have took the cord off the TV. Are y'all... Y'all tripping. Y'all better bring that cord back up here, man. We're not playing with y'all. Whoever got the cord better bring the cord. Why are you going to take the cord off the TV? Bring the cord back up here. Ain't nobody saying nothing. Dude goes towards the back to where the dudes are all trying to play like they sleep. That's been up all night because they've been indulging in their extracurricular activities, right? They've been getting high all night. And he starts snapping on them. He gets into it. One of the dudes ends up, the dude hops up out the bed, puts his shower shoes on. And before he can say anything, the big dude slides him. Boom. Sure. Sends him laying over on his side and they get to fighting in the back, right? There's no guards around. Nobody can come save your ass if you get into it back there. So he more or less beats this dude up and the dude tells him, man, it ain't enough for the cord left, man. These guys that took the cord, ripped it off the back of the TV, skinned the wire, was taking the copper out of the wire balling it up and putting it in this homemade crack pipe. I don't know what the crack, I don't know if they were smoking out of an ink pen. I don't know if somehow, if maybe somebody came up there and actually pushed the crack pipe through the little holes in the vent in the visiting room. I don't know. But I know that they ripped the cord out the back of the TV so that they could get the copper wire. I put the copper wire inside of their little crack pipe and then put the crack in there to smoke it in the jail. The rest of my time in there, we didn't have no TV. The guards came through and realized that for days now, the TV ain't been on. Nobody's going to say nothing to the guards because to do that, well, you've just told on everybody. They're going to come and investigate what happened to the TV. And if you tear your shit up, they're not real big on getting you a new one. You shouldn't have torn it up is what they're going to tell you. After you know some extended time, man, they realize the TV's broke. They come in. They start looking at it. And the first thing they notice is the cord's torn off. So they shake the whole pod down. And with all the drugs that were in there at that time, they didn't find anything. The only thing they did find was a couple of little small leftover roaches from some weed and from what the guys that rolled cigarettes laying on the outside of the windowsill. Because dudes would either smoke at the window or go get in the shower and turn the water on and smoke in the shower. Let me explain this to you. Water does not kill smoke. It might kill fire. But just because you're standing in the water and you're hitting it and blowing the smoke into the shower water coming down, it does not stop it. It just makes it like steamy smoke. That would be one of my first, my first recollections of the drug use while incarcerated. We fast forward to where I'm in the penitentiary. Now, I won't sit here and make myself out to be this guy that never got high. Voila. I smoked weed i popped pills of all different calibers if it was a pill that would get me high i did it not my whole bid but throughout my bid the last few years 
I stopped all that. I nipped all that. I said, man, why am I risking getting a dirty urine and not being able to go home to my son? Man, you got to be tripping. This is the type of shit that got you locked up and you still want to do it after everything is taken from you in life? Look at where you are, Jay. And you want to continue to do this? This ain't your friend. This has been your downfall. This and alcohol your entire life. And here you are trying to be slick and do it again while you're locked up. I did the pills. Smoke. Drank. But all around me, any and everything else you could imagine was going on. I have spoke of watching a whole group of guys pass a needle down the line with each and every one of their blood in it. And just boop, next man. Boop, next man. Boop. Passing it. All in the name of getting high. AIDS, hepatitis, all these different infections you can get. Guys didn't care. I'd seen guys smoke meth, smoke crack, snort dope. If you name it, I've seen it. One of the more grotesque things I seen was I had a cellmate that came into my cell. And dudes told me when he came in there, he wasn't my cellmate long. I don't even remember this dude's name. Steven. That was his name. He came in my cell and dude was like, oh man, you got to pluck in the cell. Pluck is a word for a junkie we use in prison. I said, dude, dude seems like, like, nah, he's a pluck, man. I was on the other side of y'all with him. All he does is chase dope all day long. He will give any and everything to get high. The boys ran him offside that yard. He done ran up a debt so big that he couldn't be over no more. So he checked in. Now he's over here. Like I'm telling you, you have issues with this dude. Watch his stuff. He'll steal from you. He'll run up debts, have dudes come to the cell wanting to beat him up. Jay, just give you the heads up. They put a junkie in the cell with you. I say, all right, boom, the dope hits the yard, hits every week. Usually when the dope comes, there's still dope from the last time it came, two, three days ago. People think that the majority of it comes through visitation. When we all know we're not stupid. These guards have access to the outside world. They don't make a lot of money. A lot of them are underpaid. They have bills. They're struggling to get by. And then some guy comes along and says, hey, bring this in, this in, this in. And I can make it to where you make anywhere from five hundred to two thousand dollars a week doing this. You want to make eight grand a month? You want to make your basic thirty grand a month a year off of your salary or whatever you make here at the prison, and another eighty thousand on top of it? Mess with me. Meet up one baby mama. She gonna give you some. So the dope would always be there, but this dude's name was trash on the yard. Nobody wanted to deal with him. So he ends up going to the fence and dealing with a dude down in another building. Somebody that wasn't on our side of the yard, that didn't know much about him, that didn't hear the whispering and comments and rumors going on on this side of the yard, right? Gives the guy a good game on what he's going to do, how he's going to pay him. He's going to have his people send the money. Just let me get it. Just put it in my hand. Gives him this little piece of paper that's folded up. 50 piece. Probably $20 worth of dope on the streets, right? I ain't no telling what it's been cut with since it's hit the prison. He comes in the cell at night and he's sitting at the table and we can still smoke at this time. And he's got a lighter and he's messing with all these little contraptions that different little pieces and parts of things he's got. And I can tell he's trying to build something. He's got a watch laid there. He's got a, um, a big pen, a clear bick. And as I'm watching him, and I'm trying to mind my business, but you in the cell with me. I need to know what you're doing over there. You, you're looking suspicious right now. You're making me think a lot, right? As I'm watching, I realize what this dude is doing. This guy is making a syringe. Out of a ballpoint pen, The inside your watch, there are... Let me see. Inside your watch, each one of these links has a little pin in it that holds these links together. Some of these links are hollow. The ones that hold this together are hollow. A lot of times, this one here on the side, this gear that turns that you adjust the time with is a hollow piece of metal. He takes his watch and piece after piece after piece, he's trying to pull these pins out. He's pushing them with a paper clip, pushing them. He finally gets one out, right? And I see him, he's down on this dirty penitentiary concrete floor got this thing at an angle and he's sharpening it sharpening it until he gets it really really sharp he then takes his lighter heats it up has already sealed the end of this ink pen right he sealed it and cut the other end of the tube off heats it up and pushes this little piece of pen in there and it heats it up until it seals i'm thinking there ain't no way this dude's about to do what i think he's gonna do with that 
big ass pen that just came out that watch. That thing is humongous. That thing is like the needle that you would get a spinal tap or something with. The thing is huge. Just the girth of it, the width of it, the thing is, you know what I mean? Not something you would ever try to, you wouldn't let nobody give you a shot like that. He gets it sharp, then I see him take a Q-tip, and he wraps saran wrap around it. Now he's got this this pen, he's putting water in it, and he's put, got this Q-tip inside this pen with the saran wrap, and he's pushing it, and water squirting out the top. I'm sitting there like, ain't no way. Hey, yo, homeboy, what is you doing, man? Man, I'm good, man. I'm going to put the curtain up over here. We used to put a sheet up, hang a sheet up where the toilet is so that you couldn't see the next man using the bathroom. Give you some privacy. Ain't nobody trying to watch you go to, you know, Brown Town, drop a doocy ball, do none of that. Go over there and you and Mr. Hanky do what y'all do. I ain't trying to see you. So we'd hang a sheet up. He gets his little folder dope out, flips the can over, puts a dope in there, takes a lighter. He's the dope up, sits it on the sink, and he hangs the sheet up. Now, I can see some of what he's doing through the sheet. You can still see the silhouette. And I can see that he's standing there at the door looking out so the guards don't walk up on him, looking out the door. And this dude is pushing this thing with everything that he's got in him, trying to shove this thing in his arm. Just, and I hear him, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh. And then I hear the grunting stop. I can tell that he's focused. He shoots up with this homemade contraption. Takes the curtain down, is sitting there nodding, sitting at the table, just nodded out. Happy, mission accomplished. He had to go to the links to do his dope. He couldn't just snort it. He was going to shoot it. And as he's sitting there, there's blood. And not a little bit of blood, a lot of blood running out of this several holes. Probably, if I had to guess, I'd say upwards of maybe six, seven holes he's poked in his arm. But as he's poked, he's went through the vein, missed the vein, cut the vein, did all types of damage to his arm before he finally got in there and was able to shoot this stuff up, right? This guy sits there nodding, and there is blood running from the crease of his arm, dripping off his elbow, hitting the floor, splatting until the pile gets bigger. This hole in his arm ain't closed up. This shit he just shoved into his arm is way too big to be putting anything or anywhere near, inside of, attempting to poke yourself with. All in the name of getting high. Once again, he's got a mom, a dad, a grandma, a brother, sisters, family members at home that think that he's locked up, he's safe. He ain't getting high. This thing on his arm would eventually get to the point. He didn't stop there. Oh, no, no. You would think that when he had this damn crater in his arm, with these other mini craters all around it, speckled, and his arm was all swollen and infected that he would stop, but he didn't. He just went and caught more dope, and to the point that his arm got abscessed and infected, and he had to go to the infirmary to have this thing lanced, to the point he had to go to the infirmary to get it fixed. Now, I talked this dummy into going to the infirmary. What he was doing was disgusting to me. It wasn't something I was used to seeing. It wasn't something I did. It wasn't something I had experienced a lot in life. I didn't grow up around people doing dope like that. I didn't really start seeing heroin addicts until I hit the penitentiary. That was the first time I'd ever seen anybody really shoot dope. This guy would be sitting there and he'd be squeezing his arm trying to get this, this pus and stuff out. And this knot on his arm is it's like half a golf ball. His arm is red. It's hot to the touch. It's purple. And he squeezed it. I'm like, yo, man, what is you doing? You're going to give me MRSA? You're going to give me staph infection? I'm freaking out behind this damn keloid he's got on his arm. This little mouth that looks like it's growing on his arm. Nah, it's all right, man. I've had this happen before. It's normal. That shit is not normal, man. Do you see the stuff that's coming out of there? The thing is just getting bigger and bigger. You need to go to the doctor, man. Day after day after day, this dude would continue. Like, now he's trying to find other places to use this damn pin syringe on, right, trying to use the other arm, his feet, different spots, and I'm telling him, like, bro, you've got to stop, man, that needs medical attention, I don't give a damn, Dr. Seuss, Dr. Kevorkian, you got to see somebody, somebody's got to look at that, you're gonna die, you're gonna die from a blood infection, right, he starts to get this black line going up his arm, and it's starting to move across his chest, other people told me, that's bad, that means it's, it's an infection moving to his heart, what am I telling the people? 
I don't know what you're going to tell them. But do you want to die? Like, is it that serious that you're willing to die behind doing this shit, man? Like, why would you do something that dumb, man? You're dumb. I didn't realize at the time how caught up in his addiction he, he was. The lengths he would go to shoot the stuff up. He goes to the counselor and tells the counselor about it. And at first he's like, look, I have an issue, but I don't want to go to the hole behind this. But I'm trying to come to y'all because I need y'all. Like, But I don't want to get in trouble. There's no way you're not going to get in trouble. The first thing they're going to do is piss you. You're going over to medical. Hey, piss in this cup. Ain't nothing you could tell us. What's wrong? He's like, man, he tells her, I think I got MRSA or I got staph infection. Well, why are you telling me? Because I don't want him to think it's something else. Red flag. He, you're trying to deny something that ain't nobody even said yet. So she sends him on over to medical. I, she, he shows her. She knows what it is. No sooner he leaves, I can only guess, she called over medical and said, we got one coming over that's got signs of drug use. He gets over there. He's infected. He's got all types of infections on his arms, different places. He's shot up with his dirty ass watch pin ink pen contraption they piss him he comes back dirty they take him throw him in the hole maybe a month month and a half later after he's they've took him to the hospital over to the well not the hospital the infirmary they've lanced this thing they've cleaned it up they gave him pills for the blood infection pills for the infection on his arm they've nursed him back to life now he's done his whole time they bring him out to a building that's a building over from me called eight building well he still owes guys for this dope Here's that dope fiend larceny I'll tell you about. That dope fiend larceny, if you've ever met somebody that was a heroin addict or was you know, caught up in addiction for a long time, they have a certain level of larceny that comes with them to where they can talk you out of your shoes, talk you out of your shirt. They wake up every day with the mission to get high. The stories they tell, the lies they, they tell, the web of deceit they weave in order to get what they need is amazing. Well, even after guys stop for a lot of guys and women, after they stop getting high, they still have that dope fiend larceny. That's where I get that word from. He comes out the hole, goes to eight building, and taps in with the dudes he got the dope from. Hey, look, man, I was trying to pay y'all, but I got knocked off. I got a dirty urine. Yeah, man, they just randomly peed me. I went to the hole. I'm out now. I'm going to get you your money, man. As soon as I go in today, I'm going to jump on the jack. Make sure your money gets, you, gets to you. Let me get some more. We're all out on the rec yard, and as we're on the rec yard this day, just walk around, doing what we're doing, spinning laps, talking, telling, you know, stories in the streets, kicking it, just bullshitting. I see the guards come running down the boulevard, and the boulevard is the main strip of sidewalk that runs in front of all of our housing units. Bunch of guards running down the boulevard with a nurse with them, and they run up in eight building. We're standing at the fence looking like, damn, somebody got stabbed, or the guards is fighting, something's going on. That's a lot of guards, a couple different nurses, what's going on? Doesn't take long, maybe four or five minutes. They come running out with their stretcher, with their gurney board. And they've got the dude laid on it. This dude has copped him some dope. I don't know if he stashed his contraption pin and his property. I don't know if he was able to get his hands on a syringe. I don't know if he just decided to snort it. I don't know what happened. But he copped his dope, went up in the cell, did it, and no deed. Made his way over to the infirmary where they gave him his Narcan. They administered and did everything they could to try to save his life. And he died. Right there at Greensville Correctional Center. Right there in S3 in the nurse's section. He died. He didn't have a whole lot of time to do from what I remember. Man, this dude was a thief. Had stolen a whole bunch of things to support his habit. Came to prison. Continued to get high. Got his loved ones at home sending money. Sending money to other people thinking that he's doing good for himself. He's got to self-convince that it's not that bad. It's okay. Came in with a couple years and left out in the bag. You know? All in the name of getting high. I remember when they came out. As soon as I seen them come out the building holding the board. And they have a board they tote. And they had him on it. And I'm a good distance away. I'm probably 60, 70 feet. I didn't even have to see the person on the board to already have a pretty good guess of who it was. It was the dude that had been in the cell with me. It was the dude that sat there and made this contraption that I believe ultimately took his life. I didn't know as I sat there watching him do this that 
fast forward a couple months, this dude would be dead. They came in, they locked that side of the yard down, that whole side of the compound down, and they came through with the dogs. They came through with this strike force, which is a certain team that shakes down. They know where to live. They didn't find anything. They rarely ever do. But it goes back to what I talked about. His people thinking that him, he was safe. His loved ones thinking that he was doing good, not knowing that he was still in there getting high. They were used to getting phone calls from him with him finding ways to trick them to send money to this person, send money to that person. And then one day they didn't get a phone call from him. They got a phone call from DOC stating that he died from an overdose while incarcerated. That's a story that has stayed fresh in my head that I've never told. It's I've debated on telling, just didn't really know how to tie it into what we talk about here. But after watching that documentary last night, Jailhouse Redemption, I thought it was an important story to tell. See, they say what happens in the dark in due times will come to light. And that's what happened with him. What he was doing when nobody else was watching, everybody eventually found out about because it took his life. He was just doing what he had always done, what he had been doing for the longest time, was just getting high to get by. That's what guys say, man, I get high to get by. And that would be what took him up off this earth, man. There was somebody's child, somebody's brother, somebody's boyfriend on the phone quite regularly talking to people. And just like that, he was gone. It goes back to me telling you I've never been anywhere I've seen places that offer substance abuse, but it doesn't really, it doesn't really work, just to be honest. But with this documentary I watched, the guys I've met personally that I know, females I know, people I know that have gone into the program, a lot of them will get out and do good for themselves. And then a lot of them get out and they do bad and they try to badmouth the program. When at the end of the day, it's not the program, it's you. I can give you the tools to go work. Now, if you don't use the tools, it's not going to work. It's the same thing with this recovery stuff. The people can give you the tools. They can give you the know-how, the knowledge to do better. You just don't get out and put them tools to work. So you fail. It's a sad, sad thing, man. But y'all already know, man, I got to get out of here. I got to get back to work. It is Friday, Friday, Friday. That means it is payday, payday, payday. Got to get this money. Got to get the guys paid. You know, these guys want their money. I want my money. I give them their money. It makes a negative in my account. I deposit the checks. If it's a positive in my account, their accounts win. My accounts win. It's the business. So I got to get back to work. I got to get back to invoicing. I got to get back to getting this money, man. To anybody dealing with something addiction related that has a struggle, just remember what I said, man, what I've talked about in the past. Everything stops when you decide. Nobody can make you do it. What happens if tomorrow you wake up and instead of saying, hey, I'm going to go get high today. What happens if tomorrow you wake up and you say, hey, I'm ready to fight this. Let's go. I'm fighting all my life. It's time I fight. The biggest fight I've ever fought in my life. Fight it. And get your life back. This crazy life that you may live in. That you're tired of. It'll end. When you want it to end. Or it'll end. With you on a gurney. You locked up in a prison somewhere. You in a graveyard. Use your brain people. I'm praying for y'all. And trust me when I say you can do it and you've got this. But anyways, these jails, detention centers, these prisons, these facilities, they're all just crazy worlds inside of this already crazy world we live in. And as always, y'all know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? And like always, this is Jay Williams. Let's live life. And to all my real ones, 
And the awesome real was watching. Cause y'all still watching me. Man, y'all know how we do. Salute. I need to cut this damn mustache. This thing is tickling the hell out of me. I'm gonna just pull it away from my nose. Yeah, it's going down, man. I look like a schnauzer, like a shit zoo, like a chihuahua. Peace, y'all. Be good, man. Be safe.